right, let's get started. Okay, welcome everybody to Fireside with FedTech. FedTech. I'm, I'm so happy to be here uh, with Lee Feldman. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am managing partner of FedTech, and uh, it's great to be here. This is a, a series we do every couple of weeks where we bring in a outside guest to get their their perspectives, opinions, and thoughts on, on topics relevant for the FedTech community. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Lee Feldman here. So Lee Feldman is a senior strategist for M12, which is Microsoft's venture fund based out of the greater Seattle area. He is responsible for technology trend analysis, thesis development, and opportunity analysis, influencing investment activities. He also conducts market and technical diligence for deals in areas of focus, including national security technology, brain computer interface, cybersecurity, data and AI, IoT and enterprise IT. He joined M12 from Microsoft's corporate strategy team, where he advised Microsoft's senior um, uh, leadership on topics related to the business health and growth of the company. He also led strategic projects and customer engagement programs for Microsoft Executive Vice President of Corporate Strategy and Core Services Engineering and Operations. Prior to joining Microsoft, Lee was a management consultant where he helped tra traditional software companies transform their business models towards anything as a service models. He has a Bachelor of Arts in Economics and a certification in Entrepreneurship from the University of Michigan. Lee also sits on the board of directors for the Young Professionals in Foreign Policy. Welcome, Lee. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great, uh, great to be here. Great to have you, Lee. Um, so first, first question here. Um, you know, we, thanks for your time and uh, excited to have you here, but let's, let's dive into your story, how you made your way through management consulting, corporate strategy to arrive at M12 Microsoft Venture Fund. There's a lot of people out here who are interested in, in taking a, a similar career path or at least end up uh, where you are. So it'd be great to hear uh, a little bit about your story. Yeah, definitely. And a lot of it, as I'll go through, I think is, uh, it's all about timing. Uh, when I graduated from school, uh, there was a lot of pressure at that time, or there was a lot of people in my uh, general circles that were all going into finance and investment banking or sales and trading or whatever it may have been. Um, but I was really more interested. I liked the business and I liked the economic side, but I really loved technology. And at this time, there was a huge shift going on, you know, 2014, 2013 with uh, cloud computing and big data and analytics. And so I kind of strayed away from the path I was uh, going down to. And I found a boutique management consulting firm out of Chicago that really was focused on helping middle market traditional on-prem software providers uh, transform their operating models to be as a service or to be cloud-based services. Um, and it was, it was pretty remarkable at the time to see how di fundamentally different the business models were. Everything from the sales and operations, the customer success units, uh, the way you do pre-sales versus post-sales, um, the metrics that you use to measure it. Uh, so that was kind of what I was doing. And that also gave me a nice little uh, first intro into the startup world. So we were doing this for some of our big on-prem clients. Uh, but one of the niches that I carved out was doing one to many. So basically giving workshops to a bunch of different startups. Uh, I loved working in the ecosystem and being involved there. Uh, so I started actually interviewing at uh, a bunch of different VCs at that time. Uh, but in the process of all that, I had an opportunity to go to Microsoft. And at that time, you know, 2015, 2016, again, Microsoft wasn't quite as uh, prominent or cool as it has been over, say, the last four or five years. Uh, but I was pretty inspired by some of the moves that they were making, the shift over to O365, the investments in Azure, a new you know, visionary CEO with Satya, um, who I think inspired a lot of change, both innovation as well as cultural at the company. And I thought, you know, VC, startups, this stuff, that's going to be around for a little bit getting in at sort of this rebasing at Microsoft was, was a neat opportunity for me. So I went over and joined this small team. It was called the SWAT team as part of our corporate strategy and development organization uh, that advised senior leaders on the health and growth of uh, the company. So basically we'd go off and do what I would call special projects. Uh, 
my particular niche uh, within there was on uh, was on new growth initiatives. So basically, it wasn't only what are the next big things, but how do we as a company make sure that we're tracking them? What are the mechanisms that we can put in place to constantly capture signal that'll tell us what that next big thing is? That was a really unique and cool opportunity because not only did I get to nerd out and look out into the future and and think about you know the next big things, how do we not miss the next mobile, say, for example, uh, but I also got to meet some of the coolest people who are still in my network today. I got to talk to external uh, futurists and technologists and executives. I got to talk to internal uh, executives and product leaders. And I think perhaps relevant for this, but also a personal uh, highlight for me was really thinking about tech transfer out of our labs and out of our research groups. Microsoft has obviously one of the biggest R&D departments in the world. And how can I extract the signal coming from there? And that was something that I put a lot of effort into as well. Um, I like to say it definitely wasn't my biggest project when I was in corporate strategy, but it was the most fun for me was uh, uh, probably about a half a year to a year long research effort in brain computer interfaces, figuring out what's the future there? What does it mean for Microsoft? What does it mean for uh, the way that we had thought about modality and interacting with computers in the past? How is that fundamentally different? Uh, so I worked really closely with our research division on building a business case for why we should be investing there. Um, eventually that did lead to a, a research group. You can look it up, Microsoft uh, Research Brain Computer Interfaces. Um, I think later on, we'll probably talk a little bit about how that actually led to some dual use opportunities as well. Um, but that was really one of the coolest things I got to work on. And I guess fast forwarding a little bit, as part of that, the leader who came on and was part of the Microsoft or who led Microsoft Corporate Strategy, his name was Kurt Del Bene. He came on and then took over our a uh, massive 15,000 person global IT and ops org. So we went from this 35 person strategy org to a global 15,000 person organization. And his mission was to transform this. How do we take 40 years of legacy technical debt and processes and operations and completely rethink them, rethink the culture surrounding them, every all everything from people to technology, to the processes themselves need to be completely transformed. And so I was doing some strategy work for him on designing this new org that eventually turned into a full-time gig. And I went over to become his uh, head of strategic initiatives. Uh, through that work is really where I started working with the government and with dual use companies and with the defense department in particular. Uh, he was the executive sponsor of uh, our DOD business, as well as uh, many of our Five Eye relationships. And, you know, if you think about a couple of years ago, that's when JEDI was happening. That's when IVAS was happening. That's when all these major uh, acquisitions were, were being floated. And it was a really interesting time for me to sit down and hear about the problems with procurement, the systems that need to be set up to do business with them. How do we actually become compliant to have best in class services for the government? Um, and I spent a lot of time in that space. The other sort of experience that I think is relevant for this was my boss at the time, uh, who I was obviously very uh, glued to uh, being sort of right hand person or strategic initiatives. Uh, he was on the Defense Innovation Board. Uh, so a lot of these papers around zero trust networking or 5G or improving relations between uh, Silicon Valley and the, the Pentagon, uh, you know, I was kind of behind the scenes doing a lot of that work. So got to learn about all that. Fast forward to today, I went over to uh, M12, which is Microsoft's venture arm. We'll tell you a little bit about that shortly. And uh, the goal of me coming over was to start this new group called a strategy and research group. Basically, in the past, we had been mainly opportunistic in the way that we invest. We had a couple core themes, which again, I'll tell you about. But in addition to that, you know, it was investor relationships, startup relationships, references would come in and we would look at those. My goal was to shift the balance a little bit, to be more thesis driven, to think about it thematically. What areas should we be investing more in? Where is there some uh, greenfield opportunity that we don't have subject matter expertise in yet today, but we probably should. And I'll go out and basically develop a thesis, uh, why or why not we should be investing in a particular area. 
and then uh, source deals in those areas, help build up the ecosystem and work on those kinds of deals. I also work on some of our more, uh, you know, I'd say obscure or technical uh, deals that require sort of more, uh, a different way of thinking about the deal itself. Uh, and that's where we are today. Wow. Okay. Thanks, Leah. That's that's a lot to a uh, lot to dive into there. Um, I, I I heard a lot of uh, interesting things. The first thing I want to talk about and dive into a little bit more is the tech transfer at uh, Microsoft at, at M12 and, and Microsoft in general. So we we work with uh, many research labs, DoD, NASA, DOE, NNSA, all, all these different research labs across the the country in universities finding the best technologies. We have some of our, uh, I, I see some of our team in the in the audience here who, who do that. And they've created uh, great frameworks and rubrics for understanding and figuring out which ones will uh, be able to uh, be commercially viable. Um, and a lot of times in dual use space. So use with the government and, and commercially as well. Um, but lo we'd love to hear what are some of the things that you think about when uh, you're looking at the technology internal to Microsoft that you're developing as to what makes this technology special, what can we invest more in, what's going to give us more ROI, um, and what should we phase out in Sunset? Yeah, it's, uh, I will, so I'll speak to this from a, you know, there's two different angles that I could speak to this from, which is my current role in M12 or my corporate strategy role, where I really was doing some of this tech transfer. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about kind of the corporate strategy days. And frankly, I think that just like in government, it's challenging to do this anywhere, right? Because when you're talking about massive companies and organizations and product priorities and customer needs of today versus customer needs of five years out, there's a lot of balance and uh, sort of prioritization that needs to happen. And I think that it can be frustrating. And I think a lot of times it kind of works itself out, but sometimes maybe slower than it should. And I think the, the, the fundamental thing here that needs to be um, clear is what are the organization's priorities and visions for the future? So we have, for example, take Microsoft, right? At one point, Azure was, was pretty much an incubation project, right? This wasn't a full-fledged uh, product at that time, but we kept investing resources in it, hang, hung in there because somebody believed in the vision of cloud computing for the future, or many people did. And people needed to fight for, for resources and for keeping you know, the lights on to these different things. Um, but once you have that sponsorship, you get people bought in on the vision, you get people to understand why this is the way the world is going to go and how what I'm providing can be a critical or enabler to that. I think that's, that's the North Star right there. It's defining the North Star. It's also the Holy Grail. And I think that relationships are a big part of it. How, you know, and this was something I think that's difficult for a lot of technologists. Um, and it's even difficult for me in many ways is how do you market your work, right? How do you do it in a way where people are familiar with what you're doing and you it's very clear how you plug into their vision. Um, a lot of that is relationship-based. A lot of that's also a narrative, right? Um, you know, and I'm not suggesting that you just make something up to make your audience happy, but you should also be thinking about, does my vision align with the vision of, of the organization or the technology direction that this stakeholder wants to go with it. And that requires a holistic understanding of the priorities, uh, who your audience is, and, and deciding is this a fit or is it not a fit? That's a, that's a really salient point because we, we work with also uh, um, large, large uh, companies and, and researchers uh, in those companies and in the, in the national labs and, and federal labs and, and universities and what they think uh, a lot of the times technologists feel like, you know, if I do the great work and I put my head down and kind of create great technology, of course, everybody is going to buy into it. I'm going to get more funding and it's great. I, I don't really need to worry about this whole softer side, which is 
um, in addition to relationship building, just, you know, selling internally um, is something that that's overlooked. And, and it's, I, I don't really think it's taught too much in, in PhD uh, courses, right? And so, so, uh, so that's not a skill that's kind of built in or, or been honed. And, and it's just getting more and more important to be able to sell your story, uh, not from, you know, an oil snake salesman, but, but more from a getting buy-in. And, and I think, yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head with, getting the priorities, understanding the priorities of the organization and how that ties into what you're doing. So you can make a, uh, you can weave a, a nice story to be able to, to, uh, to influence and persuade people to, um, you know, to give you more investment or funding or focus or whatever, whatever you need resources. So um, yeah, that's right. And the last thing I would say on that actually is, you know, I think there's a difference and it depends on what your mandate is, of course, but I think there's a difference between your goal should be to not be thought of as a science project, right? Like so, not something that you go share with execs and they're just like, this is so cool, but what do I do with it? Um, unless that is your mandate though, because there are certain groups or certain folks or certain you know, uh, researchers that they're, what they really should be doing is moving the needle in things in ways that people aren't thinking about at all. And that's okay as long as your goal isn't necessarily near-term commercialization. But if it is, one way that I like to think about that is in horizons, right? So if you're thinking about uh, a corporation or even the government for, for that matter, it's how do you define these different horizons? Horizon one, two, and three. Horizon zero basically being the businesses of today that may be sunsetted in the future. Horizon one being our next big growth levers. These are the areas of heavy investment today. We know what they are. We know what we need. Um, horizon two being these areas that are like, okay, this is the next evolution of our existing product. These are the features on top. So, uh, you know, using Microsoft terms, for example, let's say Microsoft Teams, how do we innovate on Teams? How do we change that experience? How do we bring it into the, I don't know, the metaverse someday or whatever it may be? And then I think horizon three, horizon three plus is what's the next version? of this? What's the next big paradigm shift that's going to impact the platform itself that we need to start investing in capabilities for? Um, so that's one way to think about it as well. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Um, yeah, and, and the, the other thing that you mentioned, just switching gears to BCI, brain computer interfaces, others have heard brain machine interfaces, there's been a lot of names for this. This, is, this has been around, this is not new technology uh, in, in its origin. I think it was in the 70s or 80s when it first got started for health purposes. Uh, and for those who don't know, reading um, signals in your brain uh, as the input and then having the output be something uh, related to, you know, mobility or, or, uh, or, or something else um, to, to make somebody's life easier. Uh, a lot of times around um, uh, people who have diseases like cerebral palsy, um, other kind of motor function issues there. Um, but recently, uh, in the past several years, we've seen companies like Neuralink from Elon Musk, who's using it, um, whose goal is not to just use it for uh, rehabilitation purposes and, and in, in quality of life uh, for those that, that are suffering from these uh, um, diseases sometimes, uh, but, but more for improving uh, human performance um, for, for various different uh, reasons, being more connected to the internet, being able to control things uh, with your mind, stuff that was science fiction uh, just you know 50 years ago is, is now at the very early early curve of, uh, of, of reality and prototypes. So um, tell us more about that. It's super interesting uh, yeah. to me personally, I'm sure others as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you asked about it. I think that you, you basically gave the definition I would. Um, the one other sort of way of thinking about it that, that you could is uh, passive versus active BCI, right? So there's, there's many different components, right? So when we talk about, like you said, brain computer interface is another modality of interaction with a computer itself or any computing device or robot or whatever it may be. Um, there's many versions of these types of interfaces in existence today, just taking a step back, right? Um, today, we have a mouse and touch to be able to do different things on. At one point, touch screens were obscure, right? I remember the 
internal debate I had about getting rid of my BlackBerry for an iPhone. Like, what is this touch thing and does it even work well? Or voice as another input into computing, right? I remember having to train my car, call mom, call mom. No, 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 call mom. And it took forever to train it and it was bad. Now you just say, hey, Cortana or hey, Alexa, do this, do that in natural language processing and much better analytics are able to route you to do exactly what you want to do. I think what's really interesting is using the brain as another one of those inputs, right? A mouse, you only have a couple different commands. You have left click, right click, move it around, scroll the thing, whatever else your functionality has, but it's mainly clicks. Think about how many different commands your brain could send to a device. It could be, I'm in distress. It could be, I want to speak. I want to move something in a virtual environment. I want it to reflect my facial features in an environment. There's so many different high rich signals that you can just extract from the brain. But doing so requires many different things. Doing so requires great sensors. How do you actually put the sensors in the right place or in your, in your skull or brain to be able to get close enough without enough noise so that the signal to noise ratio is high enough? How do you do that with the right level of latency? Um, so there's two different measures of that, um, uh, spatial or temporal. And then next is, so for your use case, does it need to be passive BCI or does it need to be active BCI? And the reason I bring that up is passive BCI, I think is what we're gonna see first, which is passive monitoring of brain signals that give you analytics or automated solutions to whatever that targeted use case is. So think about sports performance, right? Monitoring your brain during physical gameplay in order to tell you when to drain a putt, when you're, when you're finally calmed down enough. Or what is my affect when I am in a meeting with Jake? Am I happy? Am I sad? Is 9 a.m. the right time for this kind of meeting when I hook it up with exchange data? Should I have somebody automatically reschedule this meeting to a later time because I'm in a better state in my brain to do that? And I think that's going to give us a lot of, or game, gaming is a perfect example of this, right? Like how can, how can my mood actually be reflected on my avatar in a game itself? or change the gameplay, or you know, calm things down in a game if I'm getting a little bit overwhelmed, say. And I think those are some interesting things. What that'll do is give us a better and better understanding of the brain. It'll tell us where should the sensors be? What does this signal mean for, for this? And over time, you build up these algorithms that are better and better at predicting these things. That's when I think we can start to get some of these more high fidelity use cases in, in healthcare or in robotics or in manufacturing where you can actually think something and the machine does it for you in real time, um, active command and control. I think that uh, we will see that happen a little sooner in uh, high capital intensive and, and uh, uh, high R&D areas like medical. Uh, as you were describing, we're seeing it today. Prosthetic limbs are actually a form of that today, or cochlear implants are a form of that today. Um, but the commercial applications obviously aren't quite there yet. And I think there's a lot of risks associated with it that uh, perhaps healthier individuals may not take at this time. But I am hopeful with investments from, from Microsoft, from Neuralink, from Brian Johnson's kernel, um, from all these different areas that we're getting closer to a place where this is going to be a thing. Well, what's, uh, if you had to, and I know no, nobody likes to answer this, but if you had to put a timeline on the first, I guess, non-essential use of it, essential being for, for health uh, purposes, you know, just to enhance performance or, or, or passive, uh, you know, collecting analytics or something, what, where would you, uh, where would you put that in the in the time horizon? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple different uh, ways I would answer that. I would say, first of all, in some ways we're here and now that's happening today. There are companies that are doing this in medical. Um, we're also seeing this done in research labs. Uh, neuromarketing is actually a pretty big industry today where they'll strap you up with an EEG and watch a movie or listen to sounds and see what your brain is, is cooking up. Um, I, Sorry, I, I meant implants. Sorry, let me be uh, more specific. Okay, implants. yeah, implants, yeah. Um, I think, I mean, we're starting to see a little, again, we're, I think we're starting to see a little bit of that today. I, I think for 
Uh, we're going to see it in healthcare. I think we're here and now today. I think that there's a big hurdle to get through with any medical device um, being used for commercial purposes. Um, so I'm not sure exactly. Uh, I, I cannot put a timeline on it, but I think we're, we're getting there. And there's a lot of companies doing some really interesting things there. Uh, sure. I would say, again, I'm more excited personally about the non-invasive space. Uh, I think that this is also a huge opportunity tying it back to this audience uh, within the government. I've spoken with uh, quite a few different research labs and, and government kind of uh, subs that are uh, working on human augmentation and performance. Uh, one of the deal, uh, one of the projects that I worked on actually before moving over to my new job was uh, helping broker the deal between Microsoft and AFRL to develop what's called iNeuralS, which is basically a training system for, for pilots using brain computer interface. Uh, so I think we're trying to see that today. Awesome. Great. And AFRL, Air Force Research Lab, for those who, who, who aren't familiar. Um, let, let's, um, before we move on to dual use, because I definitely want to get there. Uh, M12 is an interesting uh, name for a venture fund. Uh, can you elaborate on the brand story and how that came to be? Yeah. So there's been, Microsoft has invested in startups in various different ways for years and years and years, but we didn't necessarily have a formal sort of venture fund like, like some others do. Uh, but we really became this, this formal venture fund. We were called Microsoft Ventures at this time. Uh, back in 2016. Uh, since then, we have renamed ourselves to M12, uh, M Microsoft 12, uh, 12 letters in entrepreneur. Um, I would say part of the reason for that sort of rebranding is we consider ourselves to be financial uh, oriented and financial return based investors as opposed to strategic investors, which is sort of um, a different model than, than you see a lot of corporates uh, doing out there. Um, so we have our own investment teams. We have our own investment mandates and processes to, to get deals. We, of course, want to build on uh, the Microsoft ecosystem, and we want to bring startups and innovative companies into it. Um, but our primary sort of North Star is those financial returns. Um, since we were started, we've made about 113 investments, uh, which, you know, quite a few, 19 exits, uh, 15 unicorns, which is pretty exciting a lot over the last year. Um, we typically do series A, B, uh, some C, and more and more, I think we're doing uh, C deals, even though we don't uh, do as many of them, um, and we don't have as many formal processes in place for them. Uh, we tend to lead a lot of our deals. I would say the one, the, the one of the key things that we look at when we're looking at companies is, you know, we're not investing in you because it's necessarily strategic for the company, but we're investing in you partly because we do see a synergy though, right? We have a platform team, which is sole responsibility is to hook you up internally with our teams into the product development roadmaps, into the customer uh, go-to-market motion, um, hook you up with technology support and innovative solutions and discounts. So we want to look for, is there adjacency or some sort of strong synergy with Microsoft that we can help unlock for you and add that incremental value beyond just giving you money. Uh, in addition, I mean, I guess the last thing I'll say here is kind of the way we talk about our focus areas, even though I think they're constantly evolving, uh, business applications, cloud infrastructure, uh, cybersecurity and identity, data and AI, uh, developer tools, uh, and healthcare and life sciences is starting to become a much bigger area for us. And lastly, uh, you know, we kind of have this catch-all uh, called Vanguard Bets, which has anything from quantum computing to uh, to deep AI to you know other deep tech type uh, areas. Great, and and so on on that, how would you um, uh, you know if if companies are on here watching the recording, how would you recommend that uh, they? you know, make themselves known, make, make M12 interested in them or other uh, corporate venture arms, um, you know, if they're trying to seek investment or partnership, what's their strategy for getting in touch uh, or, or just getting on your radar, I should say? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. And I think that the reality is, first of all, every firm is different and every person within every firm is different in the way that you engage them. I think 
Some are not necessarily good or a bad thing. Some people may be more responsive on LinkedIn. Some people may be responsive over email. Uh, but first and foremost, I think the most important thing is who is going to be the right fit. I think it's really important. There's, there's a lot of capital out there, whether it's from a formal VC, a strategic, a CVC, um, a, you know, a smart money tier one investor, uh, grant programs, the government itself, whatever it may be. Capital should not be your number one priority, but rather think about it as a partnership. Think about it as a relationship, somebody who's going to help you, who's going to add this incremental value beyond just cutting you a check. Um, somebody who you want on your board for a long time. So I think the way that you discover that is, first of all, look at other companies that are doing things similar to you. Who's investing in them? Who's excited about them that may be excited about you, but isn't directly competitive? Within there, who's the investor who's taken a strong interest to that? Some uh, venture funds have specialties. Some are segmented by geos. But I would say each investor, you can, if you look at their track record, you can kind of see a, a pattern right, of what they invest in or what they like. And I think making sure that you're, you're aligning to that person, that you know who you want to speak to, I think that's an important part of it. And then there's the question of how do you engage with them? And first and foremost, be far, you know, far beyond any other way is a warm intro is always helpful. Whether it's from a startup that founder that you've worked with who knows that person because they invested in them, one of your previous investors who's coming in on the next round and they're really excited and want to diversify and bring somebody else in. I think really figuring out who can get me in the door. If you don't have that natural in and you know this is the fun, this is the person that I want to bring on board and to you know have a seat at the table with me, I think try cold reaching out, try LinkedIn, try email. You know, I can't guarantee that you're going to get a response. I try my best to respond to every single person that does uh, uh, send me a message. I think there's a balance there, of course. Um, you know, don't have your expectations necessarily too high that it's going to be immediate or that just because you reach out, something will happen. But it can't hurt to try, whether it's an email or a LinkedIn post. Lastly, and I mean, this is always an option, but it's uh, you know, there's a lot of applications that come in. Most funds have a place on their website where you can submit some sort of application. That's an option as well. And then the last thing I would say, especially in the earlier stages, there's a lot of great kind of like competitions and stuff that investors will uh, take part in. I mean, you guys host uh, host startup showcases and I've partaken yep. in those and gotten inspiration and have seen some interesting companies through that. It's never hurts to just keep getting your name out there. Going back to what we were talking about earlier, market yourself and your company, um, not as a oil salesman, but as a technologist. And we're here. Are you interested? Here's my number. Yep, that's all. All great points. Um, yeah, I mean, so we see a, a lot of times. I get I get reached out to about you know, and uh, like a dear to whom it may concern. Uh, we are a, uh, you know, a, name it like some some random industry that I don't, uh, you know, have have any experience in or know anybody in. Uh, would you invest, you know, in, in our Series A or something like that on on LinkedIn? It's like one, they didn't get to know um, who's interested or like what, what, you know, who's the right person for it. Um, and what the, the background is of that person and what, what appeals to them. So, uh, so being specific is, is really good knowing their, their track record for investing and looking at the competition, all, all, uh, really good points. And then just being entrepreneurial and just, you know, being persistent and, and trying different mechanisms if you can't reach out to that person, right? So all, all uh, solid, solid points there. So um, I also want to note too, which I forgot to mention in the beginning, but we do have a Q&A uh, available. So if you hit it on that Q&A at the bottom, you can type in a question and we'll, we'll try to answer it um, during this as well. Um, so Let's talk a little bit about dual use technology. This is this is a space that we operate in uh, very frequently. Um, you want to just give a primer to everyone. What is what is dual use, and and what do you what are you excited about in the dual use space uh, from a from an investor perspective um, at, at M twelve? Yeah. So dual use can be 
anything, right? It can be doing business with state and local government and commercial or, you know, whatever. I think most commonly when you hear dual use, though, it's referred to as it's it's in the context of doing business with the DOD and with the commercial sector, at least in uh, my experiences, at least. And I think that we have seen waves here. I think if you look back into history, many of the biggest in technological innovations and paradigm shifts have come out of collaboration between Silicon Valley and the Pentagon. In fact, Silicon Valley was essentially funded and built by defense contracts at one point in the earlier days. I think over time, uh, as those technologies became commercially available and democratized, uh, people saw the monetization and the, the profit opportunity by selling these same technologies or working more closely with the commercial sector and the efficiencies that came with that. And the relationships between the procurement offices and, and the DOD itself in Silicon Valley sort of frayed and, and it became separated over time. I think over the last couple of years, uh, there's been a realization that that relationship needs to be strengthened again. I think that we're seeing that with all these new syndicate programs uh, that are popping up, uh, access to funding, uh, incubation programs, whether that's you know DIU or you know AFWorks or um, you know there's all these labs that are popping up that are doing work. Or we were talking about AFRL earlier, where they have people whose sole role is to find what are the commercial technologies that can enable our missions internally because we can't develop those. We can't necessarily move fast enough or our priorities have been somewhere else in the past and every four years they seem to change or whatever it may be. And I think that there's also been a realization that the barriers to doing business with the DOD have just become so untenable for fast moving startups that the incentive uh, is starting to get lost a little bit. I'm hopeful that with how much attention uh, these problems uh, are getting, that, that these barriers are going to keep coming down and that we're going to be in a future state where it is much easier to transfer back and technology back and forth, which ultimately leads to some of these synergy uh, effects. Um, so that's kind of uh, how I'm thinking about it right now. I think in terms of uh, startups themselves that let's say they start in the commercial space, I think it's a really exciting opportunity to think about how can we also land some big government contracts, right? To keep fueling our innovation. I think the challenge there is how do we not get distracted by that though? How do we realize that this is going to be hard? There are no guarantees here. Even if we win our first cyber contract, say, there's no guarantee we're going to move to phase two. We can't put all our eggs in this basket. So how do we maintain our commercial business while also trying these, you know, kind of big bet pursuits. I think on the other side, the model from, if you got your business stood up with government contracts, the fundamental business is different than in the commercial sector. You're probably doing bookings-based businesses. You're doing big multi-year projects versus selling maybe that same solution on the commercial side. You're doing monthly subscriptions. You're worried about churn. You're worried about customer satisfaction. It's a, it's a fundamentally different model. So I think finding there's, again, you could come at it from either angle and finding that middle ground is absolutely critical. And I think that's where having, again, great partners and relationships who can help you navigate, whether it's on the defense side or the commercial side is absolutely critical. Great points, great points. And, and um, you know, we, we actually support the uh, applied cyber program for the army and, and do a, a bunch of uh, other things with, uh, with cyber companies or SBIR companies, small business innovation research. Do, do you uh, do you, do you take a look at those when they come out and see the the award winners and and or do you have any experience with them? Just curious to get your your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I so no is the short answer. We do not. I think that a lot of this is something that frankly needs to be modernized over time. Like there's a central repository where you can go see any contract that comes out, but the whole process of constantly scanning that and, and figuring out like, is this one that's basically designed for another company already that I have no shot at? Um, unfortunately, that happens a lot. 
Um, I think also, you know, it's hard to decide, especially in the early stages, where do I spend my time? Is this one worth it? Or is this one worth it? Uh, so I think it, that kind of responsibility, frankly, falls on the startup a little bit. In our case, one thing that I, you know, to, to make us uh, seem like an attractive place for you, for dual use companies, we do have folks, you know, on our sales teams, uh, Microsoft sales side that are scanning these pursuits. And one of the things I uh, strive to do is to get familiarity with our companies, our portfolio companies that want to serve the government, make sure that our sales pursuits know about these companies. So if there's a gap in one of our offerings and Microsoft offerings that one of our startups can provide, they're front of mind. They're, they're right there. They can fill that gap. Let's bring them in as a partner on this much larger deal. Um, so that's one of our mechanisms that we would deploy. Again, though, that's also where I see a big opportunity uh, in making sure that you have the relationships in all these different syndicate programs as well. I think being part of uh, FedTech is, is another example, even uh, you know, outside the government groups that are doing this more proactively and can support you through that journey. Great, great. And uh, we, we have a question in here um, about uh, DevSecOps. So uh, what are, it's, it's a little bit of a general question, but uh, let's see, let's see where you take it if you, if you have any thoughts on it. So what are your thoughts on the DevSecOps industry in the direction it's heading? And then if you can also give a, um, uh, you know, a little bit of primer on DevSecOps uh, for those who are not familiar. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that this came up because one of the companies that I think is a pretty good model for what being starting off commercial and then moving into dual use could look like is one of our portfolio companies, Contrast Security. Contrast Security is a DevSecOps company. And what they've been able to do is become the choice DevSecOps platform for Platform One. Again, a great way to get your company out there for folks to know about you. Um, they form those relationships and now they're known uh, to be a provider there. In terms of the, the space more broadly, cybersecurity, taking a step back for a second, some of the biggest, most profound capital intensive innovations have happened out of the collaboration between the DOD and Silicon Valley, whether it's in space, the internet, 5G connectivity, whatever it may be. But there's a lot of things that are sort of bread and butter today that just enterprises aren't spending as much on for whatever reason that the government has an opportunity to really move the needle in the space. Cybersecurity, in my opinion, is one of those. I think that the Biden administration has come out pretty strong in their support of um, and their sort of uh, uh, advocacy of investing more into cyber solutions. I think that uh, it's... There's a lot of work to do, um, but I'm glad that they are prioritizing this like they are. My hope is that we're going to have more clear uh, recommendations, regulations, frameworks uh, around zero trust networking, whatever it may be, for securing uh, privacy, for data, for enterprise IP, for whatever it may be. Uh, so I'm hopeful that the government is actually going to step in here and really move the needle it's still moving, right? Cybersecurity spend is at an all-time high. It's going to continue to go up as breaches continue and become more and more expensive. Um, but I'm hoping that the government lights a little bit of a fire under that um, and speeds things up. On the other hand, though, there's a huge cybersecurity talent shortage. So you can only do so much. That said, though, with great sort of lower code solutions or more manageable tools, maybe in the DevSecOps space, for example, um, that'll help, uh, you know, democratize it a little bit. Yep. Great. Excellent. We have, we have a lot more questions that are rolling in here. Um, so, uh, let's see, I guess you, you, you can ask this one pretty briefly. I think you hit on some of it, but what is the typical stage of a company M12 invest in, uh, pre-revenue seed early, et cetera. I think you said A to C. Um, the typical deal size, what is your typical deal size and do you syndicate? Yeah, so, I mean, the market is so wild right now, frankly. I think, you know, if I were to go look at our company overview slide, it would say one to 20 million. I think, you know, it's a very broad range, uh, but I, I, you know, 
I guess, somewhere in that range. We tend to lead the deals. Uh, that said, we will participate in some of them if there's a strong lead. Maybe it's a specialist investor um, who sees the value and bring us in. We may partake in it uh, for uh, minimum ownership that's predefined. Uh, we do help uh, syndicate syndicate as well, although we you know, like to hope that the uh, company itself has made an impression and has investors lined up at the door that all want to get involved so that we don't necessarily need to. Um, that said, we know a lot of great investors and we're happy to help with that if we're leading the deal. Great, great. And, and um, you know, we, we talked a little bit more about the, uh, a little bit about this before, but I think it's, it's worth diving into a little bit deeper because we have, a, you know, a lot of dual use companies uh, in attendance and we'll be watching the recording as well. So uh, the balance between the commercial and government pursuits, just to sum it, sum it up of basically what, what I, what I heard you say, and then like, let's, let's elaborate on this a little bit more of if you're starting commercial, make sure you have a good foundation for commercial. And if there's an opportunity to go into to government, uh, you can, you can do so uh, strategically. Similarly for government, um, you know, the same kind of vice versa approach uh, for that, I think, um, would probably would not be the best approach is to is to pursue both with equal intensity and focus and and, and insight splitting your your time uh, where it takes very different strategies and uh, product development and critical path and and all the things that are necessary for to getting a product to market to do both at the same time um, you probably could do that at a very early stage or some some things that are 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 lightweight like like applying for SBR grant or something like that um, but but curious to, to get your perspective more on that that uh, that balance, what you've seen work, what hasn't worked in the past. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, it's just like any other, you know, startup in any even one space. Focus is absolutely key. You need to know, you can't just build tech and hope that it'll find a customer. Uh, I mean, you can, and some of, you know, some sometimes you'll hit gold and get lucky there. Uh, but more often than not, I would say you should know who your customer is and what's the use case that you're developing this technology for, especially in the early days. How do you test it? How do you make sure you're getting product market fit? And if you're starting off in the commercial space, focus on your commercial customers. The government is an enterprise in a certain sense, right? They have back office operations, they have employee engagement, they have HR, finance, and all the other functions that typical enterprises have. There's a good chance that they're going to need your work as well um, at one point. So focus on the, if that's your business, focus on the commercial customer, get good at that, develop the product, develop it great so that you know what the customer needs are, you're getting that feedback, you've gotten product market fit. Then let's think about, can we bring somebody on who's going to focus on building out our government business? Maybe it's, you know, a product lead, maybe it's a, a account executive. Um, who's this person who's going to start mapping out uh, what this product for the government is going to look like. And then if we get that traction, let's build out that business. Let's figure out how we get FedRAMP approved. Let's figure out what the contracts are. Um, and maybe my investors can help with that, or maybe some partners can help with that. If you're on the federal side, I think that, or if you're on the, the government side and that's your first customer, I think you need to make a conscious decision early on, which is, do I want to be a contractor? Do I want to only serve the government? If so, how do I really start embedding these roots to people I hire? I want people who know the acquisitions and procurement people. I want people who navigate this space very, very well, who understand the long sales cycles. I want investors who are comfortable with the long sales cycles and the bookings revenue instead of you know, traditional SaaS metrics. Does that align with their fund? Really, the foundation should be built for that then I think you can pivot. Um, I think that's really difficult to do though, perhaps more difficult than going the other way uh, from commercial over to defense. I think that again, it's the same investments though, but on the commercial side, how do I find somebody who's very strong on the commercial side, somebody who worked at big tech or at startups doing enterprise sales who can help me get in the door? Um, do I, can I build a commercial uh, product without necessarily getting new financing to do it. I think that's one thing that I see a lot is companies get excited 
that, you know, oh, you love dual use, right? Like you'll invest in my company, but there's no commercial even product yet. Uh, they're still a defense company who wants funding to go build out the commercial side. That's great, but I want to see a roadmap on how you think you're going to be successful and get product market fit there, especially if you're in the later stages and you're trying to make a late stage pivot. Absolutely, because you, it, it may be too much risk for you to just go on, uh, you know, trust us, we're going to, we, we succeeded in the government, therefore, we'll be able to succeed in the commercial markets. You need more data, you need more evidence, pilot data, customer data, or, or revenue is obviously the, the, the prime, uh, you know, indicator. Um, but uh, yeah, so that, that's, uh, that, that's really good. I, I also want to just kind of pivot back to something we talked a little bit about earlier, which is the the um, the thesis creation that you have. So super interesting job. It sounds like uh, kind of a, a, a researcher, traditional researcher type role of, of, uh, of, of finding, uh, going to different sources, uh, collecting information, and then coming out with a thesis for where you think uh, Microsoft should be investing more heavily in, and then going out and finding those companies to to make that a reality. So I, I thought that was really interesting, and I would love to hear a little bit more about the 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 process for coming up with a thesis. Is it is it talking to experts? Is it looking at data? Is it a combination? What what what, what where do you find that? Because it's it, at a certain point, the further you get into the future, the more speculative. Uh, of a nature becomes and the less uh, hard and, and much more soft it is. So um, just thoughts on how you balance that and your, your process at a high level there. Yeah. Uh, it's first of all, there, yeah, there's no one way to do it. Right. And I think it completely depends on what it is that you are looking for signal in. It could be as narrow as I'm looking for the next great mechanism for federated learning. Or it could be so much more broad to, you know, what are the next big, huge thematic areas like, you know, Web3 or space tech or whatever it may be. And in my case, I think one of the most important things is to, to, is, is to consciously think about where you are getting your signal. Make sure that bias isn't uh, too ingrained in your process to make sure you have diverse perspectives from not only people, uh, but also publications and that you're leaving politics out of it to a certain extent, but that you're also incorporating geopolitics and societal sh shifts and all these different things. So it's really thinking about uh, uh, the people, the technology and the processes again. Uh, experts reaching out to people, going to conferences, becoming part of ecosystems is critical. For example, I'm part of a defense investor network where we're talking about uh, you know, we're seeing who who's exciting all the time. We're having government officials come in and actually present to us and let us know about about what they need and what their priorities are. Uh, we're, I'm speaking to my research labs and to uh, scientists and finding out what are the next breakthroughs. I'm doing public. I'm reading uh, academic papers uh, published. Seeing. I'm also doing macro analysis on that. Is there a trend? So in BCI, for example, one of the things I looked at was. Uh, which specific sensor types are being used the most in academic papers, which seem to have the most technological advancements in that particular space as a signal. Another thing that um, I'm working on, I can't speak too much about it yet, I don't even know if I'm supposed to mention it, is uh, built a, uh, in building, it's a, you know, uh, ongoing process, a um, AI application or machine learning uh, application that uses basically hundreds and hundreds of different data points and features to predict uh, a startup's success in the future. Um, so based on what I can find about them today, uh, what's their valuation going to be uh, three rounds from now? Uh, or what if I were to go look at that in a macro perspective, what are the trends that are finding the most successful predicted startups within them? So, but that's a purpose-built application for me and for my methodology and, and for our methodology. I think everybody needs to come up with their, their own and build those connections. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, that could, that could be extremely valuable to every investor, uh, venture investor 
on, on the planet if, if you can tweak the variables so that it it's uh relevant for them specifically or their their thesis so that's that is uh that's really interesting that's um that's kind of the the holy grail um confidence intervals when when uh deciding whether to invest on on companies so that's great um so we only have a few minutes left so i don't want to I don't want to go over. Um, I want to give you the last chance. Um, what what kind of uh, takeaways do you, you want to plug anything? Can people reach out to you? What's, what what uh, what should they do here? Yeah, I mean, I think if you have uh, some exciting technology uh, product, a business itself, and you see uh, opportunity with uh, either the Microsoft platform or for your startup uh, from you know a pure financial perspective, please do reach out to me. Uh, you know, I think that it's great that you're involved already in a program uh, like you are. I think these are exactly, as I mentioned earlier, the right steps to get on people's radar. Um, keep doing that. Keep floating your deck out there. Don't do it in a doc send. Do it in a PDF, but tell them not to send it out everywhere um, or specify who you want it to go to. Doc send is just kind of annoying in that way, though. Um, and, and just market yourself. Get yourself out there. But again, I think the most important thing I said earlier is really make sure that you're partnering with the right people. Don't just spray it out and, and float it everywhere. Find somebody you have a connection with, find warm leads. In my case, you can find me on LinkedIn, shoot me a message. Uh, I hope I didn't shoot myself in the foot. I do respond to most. I'll try my best to get to yours. Uh, and yeah, good luck. Great. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to talk with, uh, with me and, and uh, sharing your thoughts with the audience. Really appreciate it, Lee. And, um, and best of luck in your, your future endeavors and, and looking forward to, uh, to having you back at some point in the future. Thanks so much. All right. Take care, everybody. Take care.